Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 65, Halloween Hangout, Q&A Live, our October AMA from Hamilton. I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby. We start live 9 p.m. on Wednesday nights, uh, Eastern, and we get rolling whenever we actually start getting rolling. But yes. you can join us here at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Yeah, we go live at 9. We start recording eh, 9 15, 9 30. Give time for the notifications to get out and people to come and show up and stop talking about coffee and start getting into other things. We did. No, the, the chat room's telling me I'm, we're lying. No, we went live at 9 p.m. About 9 32, actually. But <laughs> we were. No, we went live. Not, not, right, yeah, no, I think, I think we went live, live like two minutes late tonight. Too, oh, okay. Well, we were we were pretty close. close. We were close. As you can probably tell that we're a little off our game tonight, and I don't know why, probably because Extra Life's coming up and we're so dang busy trying to get ready for this coming weekend that we're not sleeping and we're all stressed out. But anyway, one of the things we're doing tonight is we are answering your gaming and game night questions live today. So heads up, Lobby. Get your questions ready for our Ask the Bellhop segment in the first half of the show. In addition, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on Vinhos, the new deluxe edition from um, Eagle Griffin Games. And in the game room, I've got another Halloween-themed game night to talk about. That'll be in our week in review. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, so if you would got something you'd like to let us know, send something to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We should toss in something there with your Twitter or something. Mm. Just going forward. Mm. Hey, Sean doesn't want anyone to talk to him. He's being antisocial. <laughs> Uh, All right. Up first, Tito B.A. has a horror game night suggestion. Uh, this seems like it's coming out of nowhere because we haven't talked about horror games in a long time, but I actually recently reshared my original horror themed game recommendation post and I reshared um, our podcast episode where we talked about having themed game nights. So that's where that came back up. So this is a reply to my reshare of that. Tito ended up suggesting Pandemic Cthulhu and said, my non-gamer friends like it because it's collaborative, which is a break from more popular games such as Monopoly. Well, thanks, Tito. Although I'm not sure how Cthulhu fits into the pandemic because you can't cure Cthulhu. It's the end of the world. Yes. <laughs> no, Cthulhu, what it is, is cultists are spreading everywhere. And if the cultists spread okay. to all the spots in the world, Cthulhu summoned in the game. All right, so you're immunizing against cultists. Okay, yeah, I get that. That works. And you're immunizing. <laughs> that, the air brackets are there, I think. Alrighty. Well, up next, Brad Passwaters also has a game suggestion, this time to go along with our great games for a mixed table of new players and old pros. Brad writes, I think my three favorite games in this category are Century, A New World, Splendor, and Stone Age. I've had great luck using Stone Age to te teach worker placement game fundamentals. Thanks for that comment, Brad. Uh, I haven't personally tried Century A New World. I did play the first one, and I tried the Golem Edition. It was all right. Uh, Splendor is a solid recommendation. I find that very similar to the original Century. I just personally prefer Gizmos for that type of engine builder, but all three of those, Century, Spice Roads, Splendor, and Gizmos, to me, are all pretty much the same type of game that fits the same table. Now, A New World looks a little interesting. I, I guess I haven't played that one yet. Stone Age is another really good recommendation. Now, I don't personally own it, uh, but I have played a friend's copy, and I thought it was really neat. But every time I look up gateway games, this list comes up. Basically, anytime they're like, if you want a gateway worker placement, look to Stone Age. So that one sounds fantastic. Now, finally, I want to give a shout out to Jeremy Smith, uh, Frothsoff, from the Thought Eater podcast. He does, uh, it's one of those anchor pods where they 
I guess you're just recording on your phone. Anchor podcasting is really big with the indie role playing scene and especially the old school role playing scene. And what Jeremy does, he puts out shows every day, but one of his better shows is on Wednesdays. He does what he calls the Hump Day Blogorama. And he basically does a blog crawl. He goes to a bunch of different blogs, finds a bunch of stuff, and then shares that with the world so that for those of us who don't have enough time to browse every RPG blog out there, he can kind of direct us. And he gave a shout out to the Tabletop Bellhop uh, just this week on his show about, I don't know, I don't know, halfway through, a little less than halfway through. And I got to say thanks. That's it. Like it's a ringing endorsement. Uh, he said some really nice things about our content, what we produce. And I was really impressed by that. So thank you very much, Jeremy Smith, for the shout out. Um, and yes, I, I probably do more, more about games than you could ever learn in your lifetime. <laughs> well, that's it for this week's comment. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around after the show, and we continue on even after the double bell. Already, we've had a lot of coffee talk uh, yeah. and some spelling discussions as well so far tonight, uh, as well yeah, as for those, our for mod those telling us. Follow uh, Sean and I on Twitter. Uh, you can look for the hashtag K Cup Review. Uh, it started with me trying to review K-Cups because I found a local place that sells K-Cups for 69 cents each, which is really cheap in Canadian. And they had like a ridiculous selection. And I'm like, I don't know which ones I'm going to like, so I'm going to try them all. And then I'm like, well, if I'm going to try them all anyway, I'm going to tweet about it. So I started doing it, and then Sean brought more coffee down from Hamilton, and we found coffee on Amazon, and now Sean's using the hashtag. I know Deanna even posted one today. So we've been we've been sharing our reviews a uh, fan of the show, Red Meeple Ryan, wants us to do a coffee bracket once we tried all the coffees and then figure out what the number one coffee is. So that's something you may see in the future. Not quite gaming related, but we're going to gamify our coffee drinking. This hashtag bellhop, bellhop bracket, bracket is what Ryan's looking for. But I say we just keep finding new coffees. Yeah. That's part of the problem is I can't start the bracket until I've got a big enough sample. Uh, and so I actually just reviewed Coca Mocha. Uh, and, and my comment is basically drinkable. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't go out and buy a box of the stuff, but if someone offered it to me, I wouldn't turn it down. I like the coconut in it. I like the aftertaste. I just yeah. that really residue that yep. kind of sticks to your tongue. Yeah. Yep. No, it's got it's got that 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 strange chemicaliness that is seeming to be a Brooklyn roastery signature of their flavored coffees. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, Maybe I'm gonna have Brooklyn to try. Thing. I'm gonna have to try their non-flavored coffees just to see whether it's the flavoring or the coffee because. Um, the flavored ones just aren't doing it for me, but that's what I've got a lot of right now. So maybe oily is just a feature of Brooklyn coffee. I don't know. It's something in the air or something. <laughs> Brooklyn water. Nothing like drinking from the East River. Uh. Exactly. <laughs> kind of what I was thinking about. All right. Tonight, it's all about you, you folk in the lobby. Um, we did get a couple of questions sent in before the show, so we may get to those as well. But we are here to answer your questions. We're going to do this the last Wednesday of every month. It uh, gives us a little bit of a break from having to write and ask the bellhop and lets us interact with you guys a little closer, a little more, uh, a little more interaction. Love to see more people show up every month. You folk, I apologize. Trying to get better at that. Uh, we're going to be right back with you in just a second, just as soon as we get the intro done for our, our next segment. All right. We'll be back checking in the lobby a few more times. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. Well, the best way for questions to come to us is through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of the month. And that means we're, uh, we're asking... <laughs> I've lost I don't know my where place. Sean is. Uh, yeah, uh, it is last Wednesday in October, Devil's Night, and the day before Halloween. We set aside last Wednesday of the month to answer your questions live. All right, let's start by welcoming everyone here in the lobby again. That's our chat room. That's what we like to call the people who have visited the Bellhop Hotel during our show. Um, tonight's our Halloween Hangout Q&A. Thank you very much and taking part in this monthly report. R report? Monthly <laughs> event. I don't know where a report came from. I have right. no idea. All right. Well, we're going to start off with our first question, a little bit off the gaming topic, but definitely on brand. Coffee question. Would you prefer the flavoring to be in the coffee or added by a flavored creamer? Uh, for me, in the coffee. Definitely in the coffee. Uh, flavored creamers, like I like some flavored creamers, but 
I'd rather try like everything mixed together like it's supposed to be there, whereas sometimes when you add it, it doesn't go as well. Plus, I find when you're adding with creamer, it's hard to get the percentage right. Like it's going to taste a little different every time. Excuse Absolutely. me, every time you do it. Absolutely. And my other problem is I don't put anything in my coffee. I drink black oh. coffee exclusively. So if the flavor is not in the coffee, I'm not getting the flavor generally. Yeah, we used to go to coffee shops that charge for the, the the shots of flavor, and I never found they were worth it. No, like absolutely. I like I always preferred to get an Irish cream coffee rather than say get a Colombian with an Irish cream shot. Right. Uh, for a while, my wife was doing uh, when they when they killed the um, caramel lattes in here in Canada for the Tassimo. Uh, we picked up a bottle of the, the caramel mixer, and we, she was just doing plain lattes. But even, yeah, it just wasn't the same. She never really. That we, I've got a bottle of caramel somewhere because. It just it wasn't the same and it never, never happened. Yep, fair enough. All right. So uh, we have a question from the subscriber, May Suggins. What is the best way to tell someone you hate a game without hurting their feelings or sounding like a jerk? Hmm. I like be honest, right? Like, I think that's the, the, the important part is let them know. Just say, hey, I'm not really enjoying this. I am not having fun. Uh, I think the important part in that question is depends who the person is too. Like if you are playing with the designer or you're playing with, you know, someone who's tied to the game, it's going to be different than if you're just playing with your friends. Like if I was playing with my Monday night group and I hated a game, I, it'd probably be pretty dang obvious. I hate that game. And I probably would have said it multiple times and I probably would have said why. Um, but if I'm playing a game with a designer, it's a little different, right? Um, looking at it that way, if I don't want to insult anyone, I need to determine what I don't like about the game and if it's just not the right game for me or if it's just a bad game. If it's not the right game for me, that's what I'll tell someone. So, for example, um, I will use One Child's Heart. I wouldn't say I hated that game, but I didn't really have a fun experience playing that game. Not that that game's even supposed to invoke a fun experience, but it's not what I'm looking for in an RPG. And I explain that to the person who wrote the game. I'm like, this is a neat game. It does something I've never seen before. I'm glad I got to try it, but it's not something I'm interested in playing again. That is where a game, there was nothing wrong with it. It's just not for me. Then there's a game where you play it and you're like, this is broken. That's completely different. In that case, it depends if the person's looking for feedback or not. If they're open to feedback, I'll explain why, but I'll be like, no, you know what? I didn't, I, I didn't enjoy that very much. And then if they want more information, I'll give them more information. So an example of that, I'm thinking Sean probably has a better example of this. I, I keep thinking of the time you and Deanna were at Breakout and played that um, the playtest game, like the, yes. the prototype. Yep, yep. And, and the person was looking for it. Like, you guys didn't hate it, but there were things you didn't like. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it was just a matter of, hey, you know what? You've got some, some ideas here. Uh, I think you've got a concept you're working with, and, and that's fine. But... You know, it seems like it, it was uh, some of the randomness was off and some of the, you know, it was just, you know, D was able to do some certain moves within the game and, and just there was no risk at all. Yeah. Um, and, and considering the theme of the game, it just didn't seem right. Uh, and so, you know, that they, but they were there, they were there playtesting. They were looking for advice. Yeah. If someone has just spent, you know, if someone has just spent $150 on Gloomhaven and you're really not enjoying it, it's tough. I, it, I can understand how that's tough, but at the same time, Sitting there and being unhappy as you play it week after week is not going to be any good yeah. for anyone. And that's going to create a toxic environment. So first off, don't wait. Mm -hmm. uh, get it out there. And, you know, be as polite as possible. You know, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to say, oh, I think your game is horrible. Or I think this game is horrible. Mm -hmm. Again, hate is something, is a strong emotion that you really don't actually need all that often. Uh, you know, this game isn't that enjoyable for me. This isn't the type of game I'm looking for. Uh, or I think there's some problems with this game that maybe we'll, maybe we can house rule this game. Maybe we can, mm -hmm. maybe we can make something out of this game, but right now it's not doing it for me. Uh, and then the other option is looking at, uh, creative, creative criticism. So if you are sitting down with the, with the board game designer, uh, work on terms that, that help improve the game. So if you can't stand the way they have randomized something, talk about, maybe improving ways uh, of randomizing things. Don't talk about how bad that is. Talk about ways that you can improve that there. They'll figure out that you don't like it, but you're offering positive suggestions rather than the negative uh, emotion. Yeah, I think that I think the important thing too is explain why. Yeah. Not just, wow, this game sucks. I hate this game. Like, <laughs> why? What, yep. What's wrong with it? What don't you like? And like I say, I think there's a distinction between games that aren't right for you and games that just aren't 
good, right? Like yep. <laughs> there, there, there is definite difference there, especially if you're doing play tests, right? Games can be broken. They can be wrong. Absolutely. Or they can just be not fun, right? Like the, the like I have people who come out to our events are like, you want to play Monopoly with us? And I'm like, no, I actually, I don't. But if you like that kind of game, maybe you might like this. Uh, Ryan, Ryan in the, in the uh, lobby is saying he's found it challenging to give playtest feedback off a single play. And that's absolutely true. Uh, I find, it, again, a lot of it is sort of couching your terms. Uh, you know, if you've only played once, you can comment on randomness, but you can't give an absolute statement. You, you can't give the same kind of comment as if you played it five times and really gotten to experience the randomness of something. Uh, one play is only going to give you so much. I mean, you can flip a coin a hundred times and get mm -hmm. heads all every time. Yep. Um, but you can get a feel for whether something is heading in the right direction or not and, and indicate that. Yeah. The hard part about play test feedback for a single play is very important nowadays though. As we've talked about many times in the last year, so many board games now are one and done. Yep. So that first play experience is very, very important. So if you don't, like you, the, the the developer needs that feedback. Yep. Even if it's your first play, and you're like, you know what? This feels like I I didn't get it. I, yep. I I feel like I need to play again to really grasp it. That's really important to get that across. What? Because nowadays, like, it's honest. Like there there's a feed where um, Isaac Shalev has been commenting on it, who's a, a well named known game designer about a game from Aldrich Entertainment Group that came out less than three months ago. That's already forty six percent off on Amazon. And just it's driving Isaac nuts. He's like, I don't get it. Like the, the, the board game life cycle right now is is tiny. Like it's there's no time. It's not even a year. Like it's three yeah. months. If your game isn't a hit in three months and like no games are being evergreen anymore. Yeah. Like even Azul. No one's talking about Azul anymore. We don't even talk about Azul much anymore. Like I mentioned it now, but like I, I started pumping it. Pimping is probably the wrong word. Pushing Imhotep over Azul because yep. I've moved on to a different type of gateway game. Yep. Now there's a new Azul with diamonds. And to be honest, no one's talking about Sintra. Like I don't hear anyone mention that game anymore. And, and in I, my opinion, for good reason. Yeah, I think we I think we know why that happened. Yeah, I mean the big thing, the big big takeaway I took from the uh, panels of BreakCon last year was fail early, fail often. Yeah. So you know, break break, get out there and break your game as soon as possible so that you aren't six months into your development cycle when you find mm -hmm. out that no one's buying it and you're discounting it for 46% off. Another thing to point out, just going a little tie back to the original question so you don't be a jerk, is make sure the person knows it's about the game, not them. And that may be very hard to separate for some designers or people yep. who are closely tied to the game. Um, a good way to do that is make sure you play other games with that person. Right. So that you don't just play this one game from them that you don't like it and you cut up that game. You never see the person again. They may take that personal. Whereas if you're at a gaming event, you play their game. They don't like it. Go, hey, why don't you try a game I really like and sit down and play a game with them and treat them like a person. Yep. Then they may realize because they may just be thinking you're a jerk or you don't know what you're talking about. Like if you sit down and play a different game together, you can at least get that personal connection as yep. well. Again, at a con, that's a little bit more difficult, but uh, Ryan has a great comment. Some designers use mechanisms because they personally like them and yes. not because they are the best implementations of mm -hmm. what they want to provide in a game. And that's a real problem. And again, that is something that goes to what you just said about taking things personally. A designer yeah. can have a hard time separating them get themselves from their game. Yes. Uh, so if you can remove them from that game and from that situation to talk with them and, and have a chat with them over something else and, mm -hmm. and, and, and separate from that game. Uh, give give some space and some breathing room that will help them depersonalize anything you might say. Um, okay, coming up next, uh, let's take a look at, uh, we have a question from Ranch B from the blog. What do you do when you have a steady weekly group? And as time goes by, you've got one player who is getting less willing to play other games. After all four players say, ooh, let's play that. And player five is the only one often doing the, I don't think I'd like that, play something else. It depends how well you know player five, I guess. Uh, the, the obvious thing is, is we're getting to the, we mentioned them now and then on the show, the, so, the geek social fallacies. If you are not having fun playing with player five and player five is not having fun playing with you, why are you playing with player five? Uh, there is no obligation to play with player five. Even if they're a sibling, there's probably other things you can do with them. Unless mom's sitting there saying you have to play with your brother. Um, 
like even if it's a significant other, there's probably other things you'd enjoy doing together. I get that people probably want to share time together. If they're close friends and it's a group that's been getting together for years, I don't know. It's 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 all about being an adult and actually talking about it. Um, we've talked about enthusiastic consent before. If you can't get enthusiastic consent and the problem is one player, the problem isn't the consent, it's that player. Uh, you probably want to try to find a common ground. Uh, here's again where you want to find out why, right? So instead of player, I don't think so, I don't think I'd like that, find out what they do like. And then maybe find something the other players do like that they like. Find out what it is that they're scared of in that game they don't want to play. Maybe they don't like world building and indie role playing games. Maybe they don't like narrative control. They just want to roll dice. Maybe they really have a hard time with abstract concepts and games like engine builders just are difficult for them for whatever reason that may be. Um, so maybe find a game that all five of you will enjoy, right? Oh, well, we know you can't play engine builders because you don't get the abstract thinking required to do that. How about social deduction games or how about cooperative games or looking at a different venue or, or we'll just, you know what you won't do. You don't want to play like a powered by the apocalypse super world building game and we don't really want to play D&D. &D. How about something more in the middle with a bit of narrative control? So how about some like 13th age or something like that? Like maybe you can find a middle ground, but if you can't, it's probably better for everyone, including that player. If you split the group up. Absolutely. And now when we, we say split the group up, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to throw them away. Yeah. Now what it could be as simple as, you know, three weeks a month you play Civ and that fourth week with you bring you back player five and you play worker placement games because that's what their real love and, and design is. And they and they don't like, you know, Civ or whatever, you know, Twilight Imperium, uh, you know, they don't want to play that. So you play that for the majority where the rest of the players are all all in on it. And then that one week you find something that everybody wants to do mm -hmm. and do that or two weeks, you know, however the balance works out. Uh, but, you know, just because you've got a steady weekly gaming group doesn't mean every single person has to be there mm -hmm. every single time. Just don't do the thing we did when we were kids and do the passive aggressive thing where you like change the game night from Monday to Tuesday and don't tell player five. Yeah. Be adults no. about it. Yeah. Um, assuming you're adults. I don't know how old Ranch, <laughs> Ranch B is, but assuming you're adults, um, like let, let people know, talk about it, right? Like share your feelings. It's, it's even, even though we're men, we, you know, get rid of, pull, throw that BS out and sit down and be like, Hey, look, this isn't working. Let's find out why. Let's see yeah. if there's a way to fix. And if there's not, we have to change the group. Now, uh, Ryan's mentioning someone else and I'm, and I'm not going to mention their name necessarily, but there's someone who's in a sticky situation where the one player he would really rather not have in the gaming group is in a relationship with someone who they do want in the, in the gaming group. Again, you have to sit down like that. You yeah. need to talk to that, not necessarily that couple, but talk to the person you do want and be like, look, your significant other. The, the, here's the reasons why. Again, explain why. Right. Not just, hey, we don't want your wife showing up. Like, look, when your wife shows up, she's distracting you. You're not paying attention to the game. You're doing this or, hey, when your husband's here, he's domineering and he doesn't quite get the concepts of the game and he's being aggressive or, hey, when your wife shows up, she hogs the table and like whatever it happens to be. Right. Um, you want to you want to find out what the problem is. And again, maybe you can fix the problem and then everything's hunky dory. And then you have a bigger group and everyone's having a great time. Like maybe it's just someone who's not comfortable around other people and have some awkward social habits that they can work on on their own. Um, if it doesn't work again, like there, there's no obligation to let people's significant others play. That was something we used to have a problem with. Again, this is back when I was in university and high school, so we didn't know better. So it'd be like one player would show up with the girlfriend of the week, right? Like, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And then sometimes you had the girlfriend that jumped all the other players week after week, which just made things even more awkward because then there were bitter feelings between the other players, right? But that, that's outside the game stuff, right? Yeah. Sit down, talk about it. Be like, hey, you know, I want you to play. I don't want them to play. What yeah. can we do to get this to work? Maybe the answer is if if that person has to make a decision, maybe they don't play anymore and do something else with their significant other or find a group that's a better fit. Uh, I don't, I don't believe you should ever have a, well, if you want me to play, you have to take my partner. That situation yeah. should never arise. That's in, incredibly rude uh, and, and not okay. Uh, and if that's the case, then some definite talking needs to happen about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I am more than happy to be friends with a person, uh, but just because they have another person that they are friends with doesn't mean I need to be friends with them. You know, yeah. the, the whole, uh, the whole, um, 
math relationship concept doesn't work in relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So moving on from, uh, relationships, is there a game? This is from uh, Ryan. Is there a game you have been badly wanting to table, but it just keeps getting pushed back for one reason or another? I'm thinking. I don't know, nothing bad. There's a bunch of two player games that Deanna and I just haven't gotten to that, like, I have packed on every vacation trip we're going to play stuff that's been on the pile of shame for a long time. And we always end up going with the games we know. Now, part of that is Deanna prefers to play games she knows instead of learn new games. But another part of that is um, just comfortable. It's comfortable, right? Like, I, and when we're planning the weekend, it's like, oh, we're going to spend three days at Jack's and we're going to play some board games and we're going to do all this. And one of the one of the games, the game in particular, I keep thinking is Julius Caesar, which is a block war game from Columbia Games. And Deanna and I like block war games. We have played not a lot of them, but like um, Hammer of the Scots is fantastic. And Wizard Kings is the other one, both from Columbia Games, similar mechanics, really neat games. And Julius Caesar's rated almost as good as Hammer of the Scots, but not quite. But Deanna prefers the theme more. She likes the Roman theme better than the Scottish versus the English theme. So I'm thinking she may enjoy the game even more. So, but I keep packing it, and then we get there, and we play the Duke, and we play Onitama, and we play... Um, I'm sure I'm drawing a blank on the other, the ones we've been playing the patchwork. That's the other one we've been playing a lot. Right. And we just end up playing the ones we're comfortable with. Now, I, I don't know, like it's, 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 I read the rules. We know how to play. And just once we're there at the coffee shop in the hotel, we just never play them. Right. So yeah, I just kind of rather play something we know sometimes. And as Deanna points out, sometimes when it's the two of us, we do like craft beer. And once you've had a couple of those, learning a new block new war game bad. just yep. <laughs> doesn't seem like the best choice. Not 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 your not your best go-to to learn something new when you're uh, powering them back and enjoying enjoying the night. Yes. Now the opposite though is role-playing games. My God, there are like three that I just really want to flip and play, and I just can't get a steady group. Like my Monday night group, I, I complained about it a lot online. I still love these guys. We still have a good time, but they are just so inconsistent. Now they are getting way better at someone showing up every Monday now, and we've been better at it. But like two, three, I don't even know, three weekends ago, we finally had the whole group together. I wasn't prepared to have the whole group together, and I was probably I'm playing board games, and we played a bunch of games of Horizons. And then I'm like, all right, we're done Horizons, and I thump Dungeon Crawl Classics on the table, and I show it to them, and I'm like, all right, I know you guys kind of want to play D&D. How about this? This is like D&D. There was a whole conversation on Twitter where I was talking about my group wants to play D&D. What do you do? Do you play D&D? Because I don't, I don't want to learn 5th Ed D&D right now. I did 4th Ed for years. I did before that. I just don't want to play D&D. I want to do something different. So I threw it down, and I started showing people the arts and the charts and the tables and everything, and everyone bought in. And then I went, and I gave the entire group sets of dice. Because I had bought these two Christmases ago, because that is how long I have been trying to get this group to play Dungeon Crawl Classics. So I gave them the dice, I got everything out, and it's been three weeks. We have not gotten a full group together since. So I really want to play Dungeon Crawl Classics. Uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord's another one. And my God, I badly owe someone a review of Runaway Hirelings, and I just can't get the group together to do it. No, it's tough, uh, and especially, you know, as we, we talk about it time and time again, as we get older, it's just, you know, we have so many kids and family obligations, and, you know, this meeting to go to, and this school event to go to, it it just becomes tough. Yeah. <laughs> work for a yeah. lot of people. Like, yeah. we, we have we have a, one of the members of my group travels for work. Like, he's in Germany one week, and then he's in Quebec, and then he's all over the place. Yep. So he he's one of the players. It's bad for that. Then we have another player who really, really wants to show up, but his work has been terrible for about two years, and I literally have not seen the guy in over a year now at this point. Yeah, well, there's a lot of shift work in Windsor. That's definitely yeah. a, a big a big issue. All right. Uh, so uh, with Halloween tomorrow night, this is coming from D. If you were going to a Halloween-themed party and you could bring one board game, what would it be? One. Mm. <laughs> trying to think through. Oh, it depends. If it's like party drinking and everything, Skull. If it was like a costume party, everyone's going to be having drinks in their hands, I would bring Skull. Skull and Roses, whichever version you want to go with. It's a game based on coasters. It's semi-social deduction, pusher luck betting. It was a game invented by biker gangs that you can mass market and buy now. Um, probably that. Um... 
part of me wants to say werewolf or that one version of that just because if you don't know the group it's the game that works and that's the one setting where i'd probably end up playing it especially if it's a party not a gaming event um if i knew there were going to be gamers there and we had tables and that maybe king of tokyo for for getting the theme definitely i i I think power of madness but it's just not that good it It looks cool it does it takes forever to set up and and unfortunately, you know, a lot of Halloween parties are a, you know drinking parties, and yeah. that's not really a you know. A it, great it's game. not a silly laughy game. No, it, it looks not. like it should be, and it's not. Yeah. I got an old card game. You know, it's been too long since I played it. I, I brought it out to the last two events. We're going to be talking about Halloween games later. Um, last two events called Spooks, and it's uh it's a game with four suits, and the suits are like bats, skeletons, spider webs, or something like that, and they are um, they all do something different. I, the thing is, I haven't read the rules in so long, but I remember that being a real good. So it's it's good if you play with people who know like hearts or whatever those. It, it's a variant of hearts where you're picking how many suits you're going to get, but then each suit does something. Yeah. So if you play spiders at Trump, you capture cards or something. Like I honestly, it's Steve Jackson games, but it's been so long since I played it. Like if I had gotten that played at one of the last two events, that'd probably be my answer. Um, Monster Factory, I've been playing a lot. I'm kind of jumping ahead though because <laughs> uh, Ryan, about Ryan's before. asking about Dread. I say I don't own it. I've never read it. It, it's a horror RPG. I hear Ten Candles is fantastic for horror gaming. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really have much in the way of Halloween games. I I, I would consider if I if it was RPGers, it came from the late 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 show. I've got it on the yeah, shelf. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good uh, a good Halloween game because you can throw it up. Yeah, that's a good call. That is a good one for for Halloween. Though again, I haven't read it in so long, right. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Yep. I'm sure it's simple enough. I remember yeah, the I know, character it, sheets. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty quick pickup, so wouldn't be too worried about that. I don't think. Yeah, uh, if I, only had, I don't know. Out of all those, if I only had to bring one, I like I like uh, skulls. I mean, it, I haven't yeah, played I'm it yet, but I, I know we've skull. talked about it on, on other uh, on other podcasts, and, and it's a good. Said, solid. And, and the theme is actually more Day of the Dead, but it's skulls. It fits yeah, for yeah. Halloween. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. What do we got coming up here next? We've got uh, what is everyone's favorite Halloween candy and has changed from when you were a kid? Ryan. Uh, for me, it's caramels. I love caramels. And I think it's changed. I swear I used to prefer Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> Those uh, are, I, I'm into the chocolate bars. I want the chocolate bars, the little tiny ones. Yeah. Oh, the full ones are even better. Well, but yeah. chocolate bars for me are my favorite Halloween candies. Um, I also, you know what? The only time I eat them when it, when it cuts around to Halloween is, um, runts from Wonka. I love okay. runts, yep. but it, that I only ever get them around Halloween. Yeah. I like, I would never go buy runts at a store and I never have, but I enjoy those because I don't only get them at Halloween. So that's right. why I like, yeah. Uh, for me, it's got to be coffee crisp, uh, hands down, either coffee crisp, uh, yeah. with, with, with Kit Kat coming in a close second, but not quite. I love chocolate and yeah, crunch. Yeah, caramel are Canadian. Uh, Oops, I love, sorry. I love the chocolate and the crunch, but I don't do, uh, I don't do caramel at all. I, I don't like caramel. So. I, I love caramel. I always have caramel. And then at Easter, I want the caramel, um, uh, Cadbury cream eggs. They do the caramel eggs now and yeah. <laughs> they do uh, caramel soft uh santa's at christmas yeah. uh, i don't know and ryan with... ryan's saying peanut butter cups and i know that is a huge thing people it was when i was a kid. their reese's for some reason like i love peanut butter i eat a lot of peanut butter but i think it's the kind of peanut butter i like because i can't stand peanut butter mm. in my chocolate i don't like reese it actually See, only reese does it right Other, reese and um planters planters peanut butter cups are actually better than reese yeah. planters well it's planters peanuts it kind of makes sense so yeah, it, for some reason I you know while I eat peanut butter all the time, peanut butter and chocolate for me is just a back, yeah, I back no, off. I, big uh, fan. As well, as a younger a kid, I did a lot more sugar than chocolate. Like I was big into uh, well what Americans call Smarties, what we call uh, rockets, the rockets. Yeah. Um, My kids uh, love those. I, I'm yeah, never as been a, a kid. Fan. As a kid, I did, uh, but now it's like oh wow, that's just too much sugar. I can't can't do that much sugar. I like, said so for the sugar candies, I'm still a big fan of Wonka. Runts, gobstoppers, sweet tarts. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, the sour stuff is if I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna do the the candy candy, I go no. to the sours first. Um, that's usually my go to. Sour- I, I have to be in the right mood for sour. Mm. I'll uh, I'll do the sours or uh, watermelon. If you give me a watermelon, either like a Jolly Rancher, Jolly Rancher, or the Jolly Rancher lollipops, anything watermelon, I'm there. 
There you go. But yeah, it's still a chocolate bar. Like for Halloween, that's the one I want to find. I yeah. want to find the chocolate bars. Yep. I dig the candy though. And I still love uh, the potato chip bags that you get for Halloween. It's like three chips. I can't inside. stand those. I'm like why? Why would three plain chips? Why would anyone want this? I don't know. Wow. I, I've never been a big chip fan. Even though we can get ketchup chips here. That's true. But no, I'm I'm not a Doritos are better than chips, and even then, that, that, see, I don't like worst. Cor- we, I don't we, like we corn should products. answer the worst. I I hate candy corn. Yeah, and every well, everything I'm... waxy like it, the candy pumpkins and, but no, what's worse than that? I don't even know if this still exists. And Sean will remember these as a kid. The toffee that was in the orange and black wrappers, yep. whatever the hell that was called, yeah, yeah. It's whoever like the generic, hell made it, generic Halloween toffee. It's you know, yeah, like it was garbage. I'd, I'd rather eat candy corn. That stuff was the worst. I don't know who the hell made that stuff. It was everywhere in Windsor. I don't know if it was a Windsor thing or if it was a worldwide thing, but these like twisted up ghosts and haunted houses on them. Yellow wrapper toffee. Oh, that was the worst. Yeah. Uh, Mage Kill is talking about prawn cocktail chips. Uh, yes. They're a British thing. I actually bought a case of them last summer oh, there you go. <laughs> to have around. Uh, I do love prawn cocktail chips. Absolutely. Uh, oh, that uh, stuff was terrible. Ugh. Uh, and now I'm grossed out by this. this. And see, and, I, I've i never liked any of the little caramels, the little uh, the little brown cube things. See, the brown cubes were okay. And see, I, I thought those were no. better than the other. But I, like Tootsie Rolls. I can't even eat a Tootsie yeah, Roll. Yeah, I don't like Tootsie Rolls. It's, eh. none, none of that. It's, That's also like caramel, basically. A caramel yeah. is like a caramel toffee. They're all kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. It's just, and it's just never really worked for me for whatever reason. And I think, like, and you're saying you're like Doritos. While I will lick a Dorito clean, I don't like corn chips. I don't like corn, oh, see, I love corn-based corn chips. products don't work for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll eat them. Chips. I'll eat them in a, like if, if you're going out and you're buying like a big plate of nachos, like real yep. bar nachos. And I mean, these nachos are fantastic. I was going to um, say, note to self, <laughs> don't cook nachos when Sean's in town. No, no, no. These nachos are fantastic. Uh, but that's because they, they take on everything else. But yeah. if you just give me a corn chip, of even even if it's like Dorito corn chip, it, yeah. it tastes too much like corn. So that's uh, one of my favorite things is corn, like plain corn chip Fritos. Plain, not barbecue, not right. nacho, just plain corn chips. Yeah, my wife and daughter, same thing. They, my, my, my daughter's taking tos, Tostitos and cheese to school now and i'm like no okay more power to you you won't you yep. won't get me stealing those uh, that was a good one i, I like that we had a non-gaming ama question now yep. we've proven it. it's an ama all right uh what do we have here uh which board game themed costume or cosplay would oh, you drape, drape dress up as <laughs> i don't even know what the <laughs> hell could you dress i would be a big yellow meeple uh, there's got to be something. And when, when I think about this, there's got to be something. But um, see, this one's an easy one for me, and it's kind of a cheat because I actually have a Hagrid costume already in go. my closet. So I just, you know, I've got my, uh, I've got my Harry Potter board games and, and card games, and I've got my Hagrid costume. There, I guess that'll work. I'm like, I don't know. Using a license game seems like cheating. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, if I could do the Craighart from from uh, Gloomhaven, that'd be pretty sweet. Well, yeah, because I, I really recommend Hart. not going into public with your bone saw yes. costume. I, I was thinking <laughs> about that. I've, I, if I just put the bayonet out my pants, it would totally <laughs> look like the bone saw. I wear my trench coat, and it'd be all good. Yeah, I'd be yeah. like, "Here you go. What are you supposed to be? <laughs> look at my I'm sword. a bone saw. I'm a bone saw. Bone saw. Bone uh, saw." Angie Game says, "Not a vermling." Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. The Gloomhaven characters. That'd be kind of cool. Like cosplay. You could definitely cosplay as Gloomhaven characters. <laughs> that was the Halloween when Mo got arrested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. Gloomhaven characters. I, I, that's probably the best I could think of. I was even thinking like Imperial Assault characters. Like the really cool, badass Star, Star Wars characters. But like, right. I played the DM. I'm like, I go. dress as Darth <laughs> Vader. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I keep thinking there's a better answer here, but that, that, I think that's it. Can you there go as a piece of stained, interesting ones though? Can, like, can you go as a piece of stained glass? That way you're covering both Sintra and, uh, um, <laughs> you know, go. how many how many that's different a, stained glass games are there? Right? Yeah, that now? was a thing for a little while. That was kind of weird. No, like, like, you, like I don't. No one knows the game Menu Masters, but like the first player token for Menu Masters could be an interesting thing you could dress up as or. I, I'm and, sure people have done whatever Mr. Moneybags from Monopoly, whatever oh, his name is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Meeple are kind of getting old and stale. So. Yeah. It'd be hard to walk around in like a giant full Meeple suit. 
Um, I've, seen, like, I've seen a few, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Like, yeah. Meeple, definitely. And then I got to think RPGs. I don't know. Anything Warhammer. I think yeah. I've tried it a couple times. <laughs> Had that one costume. Where put, on a gi- what is... put on a giant dry erase board and your telestrations from Major Killa. <laughs> there you go. Just right, right. Games with translucent pieces are attractive. That's that's where you get arrested, right there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You don't dress <laughs> up as you can dress up as an Azul tile, not a Centra tile. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, all right. While we're on a uh, quirky topic, Chad Roberts asked on Twitter if a Minotaur laughs hard enough, will milk come out his nose? So the first thing I come thought when I nose. saw that is Minotaur gendered. Like I think of male when I hear Minotaur. A Minotaur is is a is a, is a bull. Head on yeah. a male, so a minotaur yeah, that's, that's what I is a say. male. Uh, well, I would think by they definition, they drank milk, right? Because like minotaurs shouldn't be able to produce milk of their own right. normally. So like like I, I know in D anD D, minotaur is a race. You, I think you can play female, and I know um, Paco. Oh, I'm going to forget his last name from GMS Magazine, who is a a very flamboyant out man who is very vocal in the the gay community in Spain played a female minotaur who fed the party from his udders, which really disturbed one of the party members and because they couldn't accept the fact that this could be a thing, right? They right. they weren't accepting of that happening in a game. It, it broke their fragile little brain that, that such a thing could happen, and they were disgusted by it. And guys like, I am a female minotaur. I have udders. I produce milk. You're starving. Come on. So, but uh, classically... Uh, in in the official mythology, as described by Ovid, the Minotaur is the head of a bull on the body of a man. Right, that's the description. So, if we're following mythology and not looking at D and D races, then if a bur- bull were to find a source of milk, while yeah. while while amused, then it's possible. But here's the here's the big thing: the actual nutritional requirements of an animal of that size. Uh, and the fact that he, they were only ever fed humans uh, that were dropped off into the maze once a year, uh, they really wouldn't have any source of milk. So unless we go back to childhood and we look at the infant <laughs> minotaur suckling at its mother's teeth, teat, there's really no chance of a minotaur snorting milk out its nose if it lasts. There you go. So thank you, Chad, for that little uh, minotaur moment. For some reason, I am slightly reminded of how many moose fit in a bathtub. Uh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> or various Garfield questions. Uh, yes. As well. um, yes. All right. Uh, now, on. even a female minotaur would have to drink the milk because absolutely, yes, it, it doesn't work nope, nope. that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's no question. There is no internal method to get milk from the breast yes. to the nose with laughter. No, I, although minotaurs <laughs> are fake, so I guess you could invent something like that, but that sounds like something out of a weird anime. Yeah, yeah. And no, at that's... that, I think it's time to move to another Moving question. Moving on. Okay. <laughs> so was there ever a game so bad that it made you want to stop playing games altogether or a beer so bad that it made you want to stop drinking beer? This is from May Seconds. Uh, no, no, nothing's <laughs> made me want to stop. I, the, there is like, heck, I don't even tend to dump out beers when they're horrible. There is a beer so bad. It may make someone never want to drink beer again. And that is exotic or chapeau exotique from, I'm trying to remember the brewery. I may be able to remember it is the worst beer I have ever had that I literally spit out. Like I, I couldn't even like, I swallowed the first little bit and could not finish the mouthful, let alone the bottle, a uh, bad game. Like a, a, a I had enough game, I'd never want to play games. No, there's too many games out there. It just doesn't... The, the, the one game does not represent all games. Just as... If, like Maybe if at some point someone presented me as, here is the modern world of hobby board gaming, and I played it and it was so bad, I'd be like, oh, I never want to play this again? Possibly. Now, RPGs are a different story, because I've seen this happen to people. And it happened to me with D&D. I played a D&D session so bad I refused to ever play D&D in my entire life. I swore I would never play it. And it took me more than 10 years before I would give D&D a shot again. It was that bad a session. So that, yes, I, I could see yep. role-playing games because role-playing as a genre, if you're not used to it and you have a bad experience your first time, could scare you off role-playing. That, I think, could happen to me with LARPing. Though I now know enough about LARPing to know it's not all the same. But I have not done a LARP, but if I went and did one and had a horrible experience, I probably wouldn't want to do another one. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the key to this question is uh, whether it's your first time or not. Uh, I yeah. think any experienced gamer or beer drinker knows that there's more out there worth trying. Uh, but that very first time you experience something, it can be so bad that it drives yeah. you off. Uh, I can I can think of a few hobby games uh, where if I had played them as my first game, which I don't think anyone would be cruel enough to give them to me <laughs> as my first game, uh, I would probably say, mm, you know, maybe I'm not a board gamer. Maybe Monopoly is for me. Yeah. Um, because there's a few out there that are just that brain burning, and you know, if you're not prepared for it or something, you know, if you do, if you haven't had a gateway to to board gaming if, mm -hmm. uh, moment, and you haven't become a board gamer, uh, it's uh, you know, it's tough. So, and there's beers like that too. Again, if it's your oh. first beer and you're drinking something seriously skunky, good. <laughs> you know, why yeah. would anyone drink this? You know, well, beer does have a most almost all beer has a unique beer flavor that makes yeah. a beer, and some people just don't like that. So, yeah, it's definitely yep. a thing. But like, I'm just saying, I've never tried kombucha. I'll admit, I'll try kombucha once, and if I don't like it, I'll probably never try another kombucha, even though I know it's a brewed tea thing and they probably all taste different. Yep. So I, I could, if someone gave me a really bad kombucha, I'd probably never try another one. But yeah, yeah. for gaming, no, especially at this point, like, like, like how it couldn't, like, there is not possible that it could be a game that bad that I'm like, no, I can't game anymore. And if you want to talk about touchy feely experiences in RPGs, I have no interest in playing another one of those, but I'm not going to quit playing RPGs because Camden touched me. All right. And while we're talking about some touchy-feely RPGs and RPGs in general, I want to mention that Breakout Con tickets have gone live. Yes. They've updated their website, so Breakout Con is live and ready to go. It is March 20th to 22nd. 20th to 22nd, yes. So that uh, so the end uh, in Canada, it is the end the second weekend of the March the March break here. Um See it is. We wanted to confirm that cuz that, that date seemed late to me, but it's the second the... second weekend of March break, and all it right, shouldn't perfect. actually be even slightly conflicted as it was for me last awesome. year. So all the better. I've already got it in the calendar. Awesome. Also, Queen City Conquest has announced they're moving back to September. Oh, interesting. So that is a, another announcement that came out. I knew they were big. I didn't see a date. I didn't see a date announcement. Though, an announcement I didn't though. see a date, but I just saw that they were moving. That they yeah. they, they they sent out a survey, okay. and they had enough people say that they preferred the September date. They haven't secured a venue yet. Okay, because so I saw the announcement no that date. they're going to be bigger than ever. Like I saw the the big. Oh wait, no, that was that was breakout. That was, that was breakout. Break yeah, no, that was breakout. Break supposed is going to be bigger than ever. So that's yeah, awesome because UCC. next year, for next us, year, it's, it's good. Next year, I think I'm going to be in Wisconsin for uh, in July. So yeah, um, that's awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so no, no dates, dates yet, no venue. No. Uh, okay, uh, here's a question from R. Montgomery via the blog. Do you own more than one quiver? Yes, actually, I have two. Uh, the only reason, though, not that I don't like them, is because the first one I had was somewhat defective. Uh, if you watch my unboxing video, you see when I find it. Now, all that was wrong was a plastic insert. And all they had to do was send me a replacement insert. They sent me an entire damn quiver. So good on quiver for great customer support there. I was really impressed by that. Um so yes, I have two quivers, but not because I went out to get two quivers. I got one quiver, had an issue with it, and they replaced it with a second quiver and let me keep the original. So yes, I do have two quivers. Yeah, and you're also not a hardcore Magic player or that no. that type of of player. Um, you know, the Pokemon player who needs the multiple quivers and think, you know, I've got my Pokemon quiver and I've got my Yu Gi Oh quiver yeah. and I've got my Magic Which quiver. Which I can totally see. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if I, still I were. Do dig it. They're, they're no longer sponsoring anything on the show, nope. so nope. I do still give them a thumbs up if anyone thought we had a biased opinion before. Did I give you my second quiver? Uh, I've got one. I've got, yeah, yeah, so I did. I, I Sorry, the answer is actually no. I have one. <laughs> All right, I gave you go. the other one to Sean. I, I realized that. I'm like, wait a minute. No, I gave I gave it to Sean because to hold his key forward decks <laughs> and stuff. Uh, and, and Ryan's mentioning that they're coming out with a two-thirds size. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they're supposed to be um, doing a smaller one. Yeah. That was one of the complaints, especially with, like Magic, right? You don't need... Yeah, that much. You don't well, bring and Keyforge, that. Keyforge. I mean, you know, again, Keyforge. They're rarely. I mean, only the hardcore people are going to have the, you know, a full quiver worth of Keyforge decks. You've got, you have, you've got what go five five different games in your quiver? <laughs> last time I checked, yeah, it? something like that. I'll admit, I, I I don't play a lot of just card games. Most of my card yeah. games also have boards, so I need the whole yeah. thing coming with it. 
Uh, speaking of Quaver, we are going to have a Four Horsemen deck in our auction on Saturday Ooh. that will also be coming with custom tokens and a custom deck holder. The deck holder is really cool because it's cut so you can see the three symbols. Oh, nice. Which nice. is really nice. All right. I know Not pleasure. that anyone in our chat room probably cares because no one's from Windsor, but still. <laughs> this is, for those of you listening at home, this is why you missed our Extra Life auction. And feel shame. There you go. All right. And we've got one more question to uh, wrap up the wrap up the night, unless the uh, the chat room picks up, what are your three favorite board games to play while drunk? <laughs> three favorite board games to play while drunk. Go cuckoo. Um, the Duke, because I never lose when I'm drunk. I don't know why. I, I, I the more alcohol, the better I get at that game. And I, I I honestly don't know why. Definitely those two, and Pitch Car. Those would be my three. Right. Uh, again, I don't, I don't do too much. Uh, I definitely go cuckoo. I think after, you know, having, having yeah, experienced it, it, go cuckoo is right there. Uh, climbers, I think is yeah. a, is a fun one while you're drunk, uh, because the dex, not only does your dexterity not matter in the game, so it's, it's just not funny. supposed to so matter, it's, so but it's it just, starts. it's just funny. Uh, but as your thinking progresses, there's some really weird things can happen in that game. If people aren't thinking clearly and just moving blocks around and things. Uh, so that can definitely, definitely be a fun one. Uh, that, that's two for me. I don't, I don't know what I would say for a third one. Uh, not race for the galaxy. No. Um, but, uh, Definitely. uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't, I can't, I, don't, I can't, uh, off the top of my head. I can't say a third. I would, I, I would be willing to try the Duke drunk. I haven't yet. Can't say. Um, that, that goes back to the Deanna and I on vacation or on date night <laughs> playing yeah. two player games. I'm pretty sure Deanna has probably played. She's noting Trajan. I'm thinking she's probably played Trajan drunk. Yeah, she's not uh, Julius Caesar. <laughs> that, that was the other one we found out. All, All right, right, last chance, chat room. You got anything? We're going to give you one last chance. Um, yeah, Breakout Con tickets are, are live. Uh, QCC tickets are not live, but it looks like they're moving to September, which to me is a good thing. So, man, I like that venue. I, the, the, that pizza place near there, I've been craving. That pizza was good. And just yeah, I, but we the, get ramen. We get... Bagel Jays. Man, Bagel Jays was good. Yeah, well, you don't get Bagel Jays, but we've got the ramen, and uh, we can... We could try the taco place again if we really yeah, wanted but to risk it. Yeah, not necessarily downtown at the hotel either, right? They, they don't have a venue, so who yeah. knows? Yeah. yeah, if they're downtown, downtown. The only thing, the one thing I did like about downtown was the 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 uh, VIP party was nice and close. Right. But not that it was a problem, and thank you, Danielle, for giving us a ride. Not that it was a problem last year, but. So, uh, one more question from the uh, chat room: What uh, Ryan asks, what is the longest session of anything you've played? Um, okay. There's two answers here. One involves Sean. So I'm going to use that one. The one time we actually sat down and tried to play a full game of Warhammer fantasy battle with all of my orcs matched against all of Sean's dark elves in his sister's room. Cause she was on vacation and we started on Friday and Sunday we gave up. Yep. Yeah. We did not finish. Nope. We gave up. <laughs> yeah. Back, back, back in the old rules of Warhammer fantasy battle. When yeah. there was Warhammer fantasy battle it. first edition. Yeah. Or no, second, the hardcover book. No, yeah. I didn't have the, the box set that came out. That didn't come out over here. Yeah, when you when you just played until somebody won, didn't matter, you know, days or months or years went by. Yeah, there, <laughs> there, there were no speed up mechanics to make it a two to four hour tournament game then. Oh. I don't know how many points. Like, I don't remember any of those details. Yeah, no. I... And that was the addition of the rule where you need musicians and you wield and you change formations and yep. your musicians gave you bonuses to wheel and you go to wheel and fail your... I forget fellowship, I think was the test you had to make. And if you failed it, your unit would just move straight forward. And yep. I had scenery and we were going in buildings and we had some of the siege rules. And yeah, that was, yeah, it was, yeah, <laughs> we didn't finish the game after three days. Yeah. No, and we was... were like in school. So like, it was like, it was like a full weekend. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know how many hours a day we played, but, but, but more than we normally, yeah. you know, normal humans should. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, I, I think the longest game I ever played. Uh, now, if you're talking about uh, RPGs, uh, that's not sessions, I suppose. You know, longest session. No. Like, sessions. I mean, we've done we've done you know day long sessions of mm. RPGs, no problem. But uh, I don't think I've ever done twenty four hours. No, no, not we. We probably come close, but not uh, like know. we regularly played for twelve hours every Saturday. Oh yeah, regular absolutely. like like twelve minimum every yeah. Saturday. It wasn't one game though; it was two games. We would play. 
from noon until six and then another game from six till midnight, sometimes taking a break to watch a seven eleven buy hot dogs in between. Yeah. And that was that was every Saturday for both Sean and I for a large point part yeah. of our <laughs> young adult life. Yeah. I think is yeah. Yeah, we would start literally start at noon and finish at midnight and then sometimes go back to my parents' place and play more. Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, we had we had uh, our, our parents knew where we were and it was reasonably safe. It was we weren't downtown shooting drugs. So hey, yeah. you know, uh, they once our parents got over the uh, Satanists in D and D garbage that uh, my not parents, a, not my yeah. parents, your parents knew better. My parents <laughs> went through the Satanists or D, uh, uh, in D and D fears and horrors. Uh, but once they got over that, it's like, hey, he's playing games at the university. Uh, he's not, you know, running drugs downtown. Okay, go yep. for it. Uh, <laughs> And then when so, we did hang out downtown, we spent way too many hours at coffee shops. Exactly. Again, they still knew where I was, and my mom couldn't yeah. complain because she was just at a different coffee shop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and your sister was usually at the coffee shop we were at, so exactly. she could check up on us. Exactly. Um, so. Uh, yeah, my folks did and got over it pretty quickly. All right. So that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop segment, our October AMA. If you'd like to read more gaming and game advice, be sure to check out our blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or just show up on Wednesday and ask it right in our chat room. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with several things in the works. So now's the time to get in on that ground floor and get all those announcements the moment they happen. Uh, speaking of announcements, sign up to receive the Tabletop Bellhop weekly newsletter in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email and it recaps all the content we've released in the week previous. Uh, new blog posts, new podcast episodes, new YouTube videos, new reviews, new unboxings, anything else we create, it is listed there. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on the sidebar where you'll find a spot to subscribe. Now, join the Bellhop team Thursday nights at 9 p.m. on Twitch at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tomorrow is going to be an unboxing day. I've got a pile of stuff that's behind me, for those of you here in the chat, that I need to open up. Uh, one of them is going to be a special treat. This is something hot that is not even on store shelves yet. I picked it up today from Tabletop Renaissance. That's Windsor's newest game store this afternoon. Solon gave me a copy of the hot new, cool mini or not, Cthulhu Death May Die. The hot new big miniature game from Cool Mini, the, the, the latest Blood Raids, the latest Rising Sun, you know, the big, big box that's coming out. So I'm going to be unboxing that as well as some games from Ravensburger, including the new Minecraft game. I'm looking to open up Jaws and Horrified. And then I got a bunch of stuff from Origins I still haven't opened yet. So I'm going to get to those if I can. And then I got another box beside me that those of you in the chat, if you want to stay around, you'll get to see what games are in that after we're done recording the show. And now, this, these yeah. unboxings are going to be coming out on Mondays in the coming week. So I'm um, actually hoping, I don't know if it's going to work with Extra Life, I'm hoping to get the Cthulhu unboxed tomorrow and then hopefully get the video up for Monday because the game hits the street on November 1st. So I want to try to get it out as soon as I can. Like Even better is if we can get it out tomorrow, but I don't think that's going to happen. If I can get an unboxing out before it hits the street, that'd be cooler. But the Monday after it hits the street, that's still pretty quick for us. All right, one more announcement, one more, more of a thank you. I want to thank Brian Weiss uh, for providing this shirt. I think it's pretty sweet. I realize those of you on the podcast can't actually see this, but I've got an RPG and Co shirt on it. It's got a Mind Flayer on it. I forget what it says at the bottom, but I think it says, I want to eat your brains. So this comes from RPG and Co, which you can find at playrpgandco.com. Uh, we are working with Brian. To do something pretty cool, Brian is designing our new Tabletop Bellhop logos and our new branding, which you'll be able to see sometime after Extra Life because we don't have time to work on that stuff right now. Sometime when that's done, sometime soon, probably before the end of the new year, you will get to see some new logos, some new work that Brian has done. Uh, you may recognize Brian's work from such other streamers, not as well known as us, but these guys called Critical Role. Uh, he's worked with them in the past. Uh, he does a bunch of different shirts and other stuff like that. 
So head over to Play RPG and Co. to check out Brian's work. Up next, the Bellhop's initial thoughts on Vinhouse Deluxe from Eagle Griffin Games. All right, first things first, thank you, Eagle Griffin Games, for providing me with a review copy of Vinhouse Deluxe at Origins. I've been wanting to check this game out for a long time. It came out in 2016, though originally was released in 2010. This is an update of the 2010 edition. Now, I do need to point out that this is an initial impressions review. This is just my first thoughts on the game. I've only played the game a couple times so far. I will be planning on doing a full review after I've gotten to the game to the table a bit more often and with some different player accounts. Yeah, so this game has got a lot of buzz. Uh, for those of you not uh, familiar with your Portuguese, Vinhos <laughs> is the Portuguese word for wine. Uh, now, with uh, 3, 000, uh, over 3,000 ratings, this is an 8.2 on yeah. Board Game Geek, and it's got a weight of 4. So this is not your you know mom's light, uh, no. lightweight table game. Not at all. All right, so physically... Vinhos is big. It is a big box, a big, awkward box that I still haven't figured out where the heck I'm going to put it on my shelves. Now, this isn't like Gloomhaven type. It's different. It's thinner and bigger. It kind of looks like the Lords of Waterdeep part box, but it's actually wider and it's way heavier. There is a ton of cardboard in this box. Bring it home. It's ridiculous. When you buy this game, the lid doesn't fit on purpose. Like it's packaged so that once you take a punch, all the stuff and put it in the right spots, it does shut. It's that big. There is so much stuff. Now, once you do punch everything, it fits great, which is cool. Now, the box also comes with a box insert, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's not the best insert I've seen, but it's way better than what most publishers provide. Uh, it's a great storage solution for the various player components in the vineyards. But then everything else is just a bunch of open compartments that are generic, and you can kind of put what you want in them. Uh, I guess it's no custom insert. It's no, you know, Meeple Reel two-folded space or anything like that, but it works. Excellent. Uh, it's always good, you know, when you're when your game, especially a game that's got this many pieces in it, yeah. has at least something to give you a fighting chance to keep it organized. Because yeah. yeah. again, with, when you get to this size, baggies alone are still a, a little bit unwieldy. Uh, you need a little bit more than that. And what's nice is it has a lid like there's you put all the stuff in the insert and then you put a plastic lid on it. So I could stand this on its edge, which, again, won't fit where I want to fit it. My shelves aren't tall enough. I, I'll find somewhere to put it. Now, the actual components in the game are great. Um, the first thing I noticed when I'm punching this game is this is some of the thickest cardboard I've ever seen. All the tiles and tokens are meaty and easy to pick up and easy to handle because of this. Wooden components are solid. Uh, player colors are colorblind friendly, which is always a nice touch. So Deanna's getting really sick of games she can't play green in anymore. Uh, money is represented by chits. I got to say, I kind of wish that was metal coins. But the chits represent paper bills, so it'd be kind of weird having a metal version of paper bills. And, well, everyone hates paper money, so I get why they went with chits. So I can't really complain. I just feel like with the deluxe edition, I want that tactile, clinky sound. I don't know. But the money's supposed to be paper, so I get it. Uh, the board, colorful without being garish, and the iconography is actually fantastic. Like, really good. When teaching the game, it was really easy to be able to point stuff on the board, and it just made sense. It's interesting, actually, as you were saying that, I was flipping through some pictures on Board Game Geek, and the picture I was on was someone who had already swapped metal uh, tokens in for their, their <laughs> There bills. you go, metal point. Um, now, I have to say, the one thing I definitely notice with the thickness of the cardboard, and there's no question, this is thick cardboard, yeah. is I would be wary of moisture, like even more yeah. than most. Uh, this is the kind of thick cardboard where because you've got all those layers in there, if it gets damp you're going to get some real buckling and strangeness happening. So that is one negative that can come with the fantastic yeah, thing that is great thick cardboard. Now, it did come with, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, multiple desiccant packages yep. were in there from the packaging. Good. And here's a tip. Don't throw those out. Like, yeah, that's yeah. a thing. Keep them in your games. I was Absolutely. dumb and didn't, but I do have a dehumidifier <laughs> in my basement now, yep. which people on our Gloom Stream, stream <laughs> happen to notice. Um, one of the things that's going to shock you with this when you first open it is it's a fantasy. It's not a fantasy flight game, but comes with three books. Uh, two of them are rule books and the third is a reference book, which I I've complained about this before. Um, fantasy flight does it. And it just annoys me. Uh, when playing, you're going to use one book to set up then you're going to go to the rule book to look at how to play. And then in the middle of the rule book, it's going to be grab one of these tiles for what those tiles mean. Go back to that other book. So then you're going to go back to the other book and then you're going to have to go back to the rule book to keep reading. Like, like 
I don't understand why they didn't just put the reference book in both the other books, especially for the cost of this game. Like, just give me two books, one with the, the one set of rules, one with the other set of rules, and ditch the reference list. Like, why is setup in a separate book? I don't get it. That that kind of drives me nuts. But hey, other than that, it looks fantastic. It's it's probably one of the better looking games in my collection. It's it's not quite up there with you know um, Gentis Deluxe, but it's pretty close. Uh, and I have to say, the art on the box cover is very nice. I've seen a few people using pictures of it with the board game as like on a shelf, we you know yeah. like on a wine shelf sort of thing. And it doesn't stick out. It's not garish at all. It's a, it's a, the colors are muted and it has a very sort of a wine and country feel to yeah. the, to the whole art design. So it's not a game that you'd mind having out on a shelf. Yeah, fair. Now for they an actual pretty... look. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Tall. Yeah. So on, on top of an, uh, of, you know, over the fireplace or something. Yeah. yeah there you um, go. So for an actual look at what comes on the, uh, in the box, check out our Vinos Deluxe unboxing video on YouTube. All right, so the game looks good. How's it play? Uh, this is a heavy game, definitely heavy, but I wouldn't call it complicated. Uh, I definitely found this easier to learn and teach than Anachrony. If you want to hear my thoughts on Anachrony, listen two episodes back. Um, my first play, we played a single two-player game using the 2016 vintage rules. So now I mentioned the two rule books before. The game comes with two sets of rules. This edition is an update to the original 2010 release. And it comes with an updated set of rules, uh, the 2016 rules, but it also comes with a tweaked version of the original 2010 rules, which is called the 2010 Reserve, sticking to the whole wine thing. Now, the 2016 rules we used are the default and somewhat lighter and more accessible. From what I remember, the weight of the original rules is like 4.6 or something like that, or 4.5. All right. Now, Vinhost plays out over six rounds, each representing a year. Each round, you're going to get two actions, only two actions. Actions are selected by moving a meeple on something they call a quadrel. Now, I know a lot of gaming terms. I've never heard the term quadrel before. I don't know if they made it up for this game or if it's a mechanic that's in anything else. I'd actually be curious. If anyone else has played a game with a quadrel, let me know. So what the quadrel is in this, and possibly at all quadrels, is a three-by-three three grid where you have a worker playing piece in the middle. You move your worker each round. You can move to an adjacent square, that's free, but moving two squares costs you one dollar, or one bagos. The money's called bagos in this. I'm assuming that's a Portuguese word. Also, if you move on to a square with another player, you have to pay them a buck. Finally, there's a round marker that moves through the years, so it's going to be on one of the eight squares. It's going to be one of six of the eight squares, and if it's there, you have to pay the bank a buck. Now, the actual actions on those nine spots include buying new vineyards, building a winery or an estate, on, sorry, on an estate, building a winery, buying new vineyards, uh, selling wine to the local market, shipping wine overseas, building a cellar, hiring farmers or onologists, hiring wine experts or passing. And when you pass, you can also send a press release. Okay. Now, without getting into too much detail, since this is just an initial thoughts review, you basically buy vineyards to make wine, Add wineries, sellers, farmers, and enologists to improve the quality of your wine. Sell wine to make you money. Ship wine to make you victory points. Press releases are for wine tasting competitions that happen three times during the game. And wine experts give you bonus actions and help you during the wine tastings. Now, weather and the whims of the wine magnates also has an impact on the wine quality and value. Wine tastings are worth mentioning because they're a huge part of the game. Three times during the game, there's a wine tasting festival. Players each submit one wine, which scores points based on its value. Players can use experts to boost that value depending on what quality the judges are looking for that year, and it changes every year. Points are awarded based on the rank, and players can unlock wine barrels if their wine meets the criteria of the wine magnates. Now, this criteria changes every turn, so one of the wine magnates will want either a white, red, white or a red wine, Another one will want wine from a specific region, and a third one will want wine of a certain quality. Now, after each festival, players can sell wine to purchase magnate action tiles and multiplier tiles. Magnate action tiles let you take extra actions, because remember, you can only take two a turn, so they're huge. And multiplier tiles are for end game scoring. So, I, I've, uh, some people are talking about how the, uh, the game feels a little restrictive in... Uh, um 
Sorry, and I, and I think these are, I honestly think these are people finding finding things to pick at for no particular reason. <laughs> but the 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 sort of ability set and the the limitations on movement is a problem. Is that? Uh, I wouldn't. I a problem. I think is wrong. I think it's. I don't know if they call it a feature, but it's it's that is the game. Right. It is tight. It is hard. It is hard to get the right action without having to pay someone, and it's hard to predict what the other players are doing. I, I, I guess I would say it's a feature of the game. I wouldn't say it's a highlight of the game, but to me, that's part of this quadrille, and that's part of what it is. Like, I think if you don't like that aspect, you shouldn't be playing Vinos. It's not for you. Yep. So I realized that was a big blah of a bunch of mechanics, and that's pretty much it. it there is a lot going on on Vinos. The thing is, when you're sitting down, when it's there in front of you and you can see all the things, it's never too much. It doesn't feel overwhelming. The individual actions, and there weren't even nine of them, even though there's nine spots, there's eight different actions, are all pretty simple. Like each one, like buying a vineyard. You spend your money and you pick two vineyards and you have your vineyards. Buying a winery, you take a winery tile and put it on one of your estates. Done, right? Like they're all very simple. And there aren't any like chain interactions, right? Like I think a tale to walk in, which is complicated because, oh, because I did this, I have to remember to do that because I, that doesn't happen in Vinos. You just, you do the thing. Done. I, I, I bought a cellar from one of my wineries. Done. I paid the money. I take the cellar. I'm done. It's very simple. All of the complexity and weight actually comes out into figuring out how to use those actions and what to do and what's more effective for you to do. And like you mentioned, knowing where to move and realizing that you're not going to be able to sell this wine because there's three other people there and you don't have any money. And what you can do to mitigate that, because that actually happened to me in my second play I spent all my money and realized I can do nothing because I have no money left. So I have to take the pass action. And I ended up having to Google it because at the time I was thinking I'm going to spend the rest of the game just taking the pass action over and over while you guys play. Mm -hmm. And then I realized the pass action lets me determine my player order. And by doing that, I can make sure I play after everyone moves out of the sell action and then get back into the game, which is really cool. Like I totally missed it for having read the rules and played the game once. The second play, I made this mistake is like, I'm sunk. I'm done. I thought I did the power grid thing where I spent all my money so I can't buy any more power grids and I can't buy any of the tools to power my power grid. And I walked myself out of the game. No, the game accounts for this. Yes, I got punished. I had to pass and not get something that turn. And it might have cost me the game, but at least I wasn't out. Right. So this is just an example of the kind of things you're thinking about, right? You have a lot to think about. So you have a white wine with quality six. Now what do I do with it? Do I build a cellar to make its quality go up by one now and more every round if I let it sit in cellar? Or do I sell it right now so I can have that $6 so I can buy another vineyard? Or maybe that's the wine I should be sending to the tasting festival because the magnates really want a white with a value of six or more. That's the kind of decisions you have to make. Right. No, it's interesting. I, I, what, I'm, what I'm seeing in comments is a lot of people uh, sort of battling it out over which version of the rules is the tighter, better version. Yeah. Uh, that there's a whole yeah, fight between 2010, that. 2016, uh, with, with people coming down on both sides, uh, for various reasons. Yeah. At this point, like I said, the initial thoughts, I've only played the 2016, uh, the 2010 seems to be more of the, the heavy gamers game seems to be the 18 XX players like it. There is a bank. And there is investment involved, which is not part of the version I played. Uh, the wine festival, I guess, is completely different. So I haven't seen that. Right. And I asked people what I should start with. And the vehement reply was start with 2016. But yeah. lots of people also said then move on to 2010 as quick as you can because it's better. Yeah, so, that that's that that was sort of the feeling I was getting from from reading through comments and, and suggestions was, you know, for the real, you know, heavy gamer lovers. Um, 2016 is the easy intro, get yeah. into the flow of the game and then, and then jump back to the 2010, um, uh, comments like, you know, they, they, they polished off some of the rough edges that made 2010 a better game and more enjoyable sort of thing. Yeah. And supposedly the deluxe version of 2010 is significantly better than the original, even though the original was good is right. what I've read through is the tweaks that like they called them tweaks really help. Right. But overall, like even the 2016 is, is a tight, unforgiving game. It's one of those games where you can't do all the things and this is worse than most. Like you, there's no way you can do all the things. Like don't even right. try to think you're <laughs> going to get to 
have an estate that's going to have farmers and onologists and and all the wineries and a cellar and produce 20 wines every turn. It's just not going to happen. Right. You only get two actions a year and you're only playing for six years and you got to make those two actions count. And it's tough. Like you are, you don't not only have to watch like the board state, right? You're not only just watching the weather and the women of the magnates, but you have to be keenly aware of how much money you have on hand and how much money you're going to need. And you have to do all this while watching your opponents because which actions they take is going to directly impact your cost. And like you, uh, there's just so much to think about. Like there is trying to figure out what wine your opponent's going to send to the tasting fair. Like it's crazy. It's, it is a brain burner. And the one thing that the biggest caveat is if you don't like heavy games, you're probably not going to enjoy this. But if you have a group that has AP issues who like to plan out every little thing, Back this off. can can take a long time. Like, make sure everyone's cool with that. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, what is the, the playtime on it? Is... It's a weird one. It's like two hours and 15 minutes, I think is what BGG said. Uh, 60 to 135. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. it's a weird weird yeah. number it took deanna and i three hours to play our two hour two player game but that did involve having it's to teach her the rules and and uh, it's and, and i've uh, there's there are some comments saying it's it's a rough one to teach and until you get into it and start playing it's one of those games where yeah. it's it's rough um but and, we, and again we've, we've covered the problems with the the multiple rule books and it's definitely easier to teach though than a game like anachrony there's just not as many interactions even right. though i'm sure anachrony's weight's way lower but just teaching it, Teo to Watkins, another example. It doesn't have that, the chain, right? Like that's always hard to teach is the, yep. when you do this, you get this. And because you got that, you get this. Venus doesn't have that. It's you did this, you get this, you do that, you get this, you do that, you get that. And the complexness, the complexity is from shoot. I wanted to do that, but now Sean's there. What the heck do I do now? Right? right. Like that's where it comes in. And even better is the taking it to the next level going, Ooh, I knew Sean was going to move there right. or, you know, right. And predicting what your opponent's going to do. Yep. Now, I realize I covered a lot. Like, I explained a lot of stuff here, and that is nothing compared to the amount of detail I went in on the actual blog post. Like, there's even more detail there. I really go into detail of the tasting festivals and the magnates and how to make them happy. And I talk about barrels and why you want more barrels and stuff like that. So this this was still, even though I know it was a lot of info, still just kind of scratching the surface of Vinos. All right. Well, to read that, head over to the tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the table, Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year, what games hit our tables. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right, Saturday night was another Halloween theme gaming event here in Windsor. Um, they're pretty common around this time of year. This particular one was at the CG Realm on Saturday. Uh, the main thing I was there to do was demos of Dead Man's Cabal. I had uh, volunteered to do demos of that from Pandasaurus Games. I did end up teaching and playing two games of Dead Man's Cabal through the night. Now, the first one was a four-player game. Three of the players already knew the rules, including me, obviously. Now, the fourth bought the game, had read the rules, but not actually played. So everyone was pretty much familiar with the game. Uh, this went rather well. Uh, with everyone knowing the rules, it was much closer than most of our games of Dead Man's Cabal, which was cool to see. Um, the thing with Dead Man's Cabal, and I've mentioned it every time I've talked about the game, I think, including the first time, is the Oracle board and the final scoring and the interaction there and how much it matters because no matter how much i stress the importance of this board new players never give it enough focus including the player who had only read the rule book points from the oracle will usually be 50 to 75 percent of your score at the end of the game and even saying that people just don't focus enough on it yeah no this is something that's come up again it's come up every time we talk about it i've seen it brought up by others on twitter and we had someone whose name I won't uh, mention related to the game talking to us after uh, the show last week, and they were mentioning that the game was actually tighter in an earlier version. Um, yeah. And the scoring was tighter. So I, I kind of wish I could see that. Like, and I wonder what the, the thought process was to change it. Well, you know what? Unfortunately, there are so many different factors that go into building these games. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard to say what, you know, what wins out, what's going to make the, the cut and yeah, what's not. Yeah, true. 
Now, the last game of the night, I'll get back to the middle, was another Dead Man's Cabal. Just makes sense to take a talk about it, all the games here. Now, this was a slightly different mix of players. Uh, this included a local Nick uh, who had not played it before. Now, Nick's, Nick's a cool guy. I've seen him out at DD Realm many times, but he usually hangs out with the miniature gamers. And I'm not trying to say like board gamer, miniature gamer divide there, but I'm usually playing board games. He's usually playing miniature games. So I thought it was really cool to get him over and play some games with him. I never have before. Uh, now he's a seasoned gamer, very familiar, especially with fantasy flight style games. And he picked up most of the concepts of Dead Man's Cabal well. The problem was, as I just mentioned, the Oracle. He didn't spend nearly enough focus on that. And his final score really suffered for it. Yeah, it's it's one of those games where I think the theme on this is fantastic, uh, especially for, you know, around the Halloween time. I mean, mm. the the entire concept of the game, yes. you describe this game to me and I'm like, that is so cool. That just uh -huh. sounds like so much fun. I love the idea of it. But then I hear and I see I see it played and I hear over and over again that it's just got scoring problems until you until you've learned. Yeah. And you've taken your losses and, you know, learned that what you did was wrong and you need to try something different next time. And any game that requires you to t take a beating and to learn mm -hmm. uh, that, that you've played it wrong, I've got some problems with that. See, that's it. I, I hate to say it myself, but my overall impression of Dead Man's Cabal is going down. It's, it's going the wrong way. It's getting worse. Uh, like you said, I love the theme. Like, come on, necromancers going to a party so they have to resurrect an entourage. That's amazing. The components are amazing. These like little skulls and bones and the, the, the cow skull, the mark who's gone. The gameplay is even solid. Like I love the action selection mechanism of pushing the skulls down and the private action and public action. It's really cool. And everything is fun and everyone's great and everyone's having a good time until you get to that end game scoring. There's just too much relying on where you spend your cubes on the Oracle board, which also drives to how important it is to get runes because that's how you get your cubes out. None of the games I played have really been close. Like I noted the game earlier was our closest game, but like our usual spread is like 80 to 120 points between first and last. Like it, it's crazy amount of spread between the two. Yeah. Like, I like the game. I I'd, honestly, I'll play it. Like, someone says, hey, I want to learn Dead Man's Cabal. I'll happily teach it. But, like, this isn't a game that I'm going to be pushing anymore. It's not one I'm like, hey, come over, play Dead Man's Cabal. It's awesome. I can't see myself saying that anymore. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, like you said, like, I wonder if they loosened it up because I did enjoy my first play more. Possibly. Even though we did it wrong. And yeah. I have to say, like, if you do it well and you're like, whoa, I scored 180 points, you feel good about that. And then you're... Like, I almost wonder if that's why they loosened it up for the one and done factor. Because I've now played this, I don't know, I'd have to look it up, but I, I don't know, almost 10 times, if not 10 times. And now I'm starting to think, eh. Right. It well, took I mean, that that's, long. That's, I mean, for many games these days, if you get it on the table 10 times, that's pretty impressive. Now, yeah. admittedly, you fight to get them on at least five times for a review. So, yeah. you know, but still, let's say you've got it five more times than that. That's still not horrible. But it's definitely showing it's, uh, you know, not on a solid ground. Yeah, the other thing we got pointed out to us is there's a printing error on the scoring board, which I thought was interesting. But oddly, it's two-sided. And one side's right and the other side's wrong. <laughs> so someone pointed out when we were on a, in a YouTube video, actually. And then I checked it and I'm like, huh. And then Chad was there. He had his copy. He's the one who had read the rules. His copy is the same as mine. So it seems like it's a common printing area. But it doesn't affect the game because the other side of the board's fine. Right. All right, going back to the start of the night. So after our first game of Dead Man's Cabal, um, it, it's slightly brain burning. Like it's not it's not a heavy game, but it's a heavier game. There are thinking involved. I felt like playing something light, uh, and I broke out Monster Factory again. Um, the other reason I broke it out is it was still fairly early in the night, and I was hoping more players would show up. So I just didn't want to be heavily invested in a nice big game. Now I don't know if people remember this from last week, but I did talk about it because I had broke it out at easy mode, and it was a huge hit. And I got to say, it went over just as well at the CG Realm when we played. Now, what I thought was funny playing at the CG Realm, and this was very different at Easy Mode, is one of the reasons I broke it out at Easy Mode is we had a bunch of new gamers who like new Monopoly and not hobby games. No, here I was sitting with some of the biggest heavy game fans in the city, and here we are playing Monster Hunters, which I think is age four, or sorry, not Monster Hunter, Monster Factory, which I think is age four plus. Five, uh, this, five plus. This, five <laughs> plus, so there you go. Like, this wasn't a mix of new gamers. This is a bunch of old pros. 
And this is a 1.4 weight game. Yeah. Uh, yep. But you know what? It's got fantastic original art designed and colored for this game you, yeah. uh, specifically. Well, it's, like, it's the fact, like, when you play with gamers, it is a backstabby cutthroat game. When I play with my kids, it's all about making a cute looking monster. Well, cute's the wrong word. A <laughs> gross, mostly gross. Uh, a monster, a neat looking monster. No, this was all about screwing over the other players. Because in Monster Factory, you can put your tile on your monster or anyone else's. And I gotta say, in this game, I think we placed more tiles on other people's monsters than we did on our own, just trying to screw each other over. Yeah. And you say you say gross, but they are all smiley monsters. Yes, uh, like it, it gross, like yeah. not. And they're 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 <laughs> disgusting, but they're happy disgusting. Yes, gross, not creepy. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, after Monster Hunters, I end up sticking with the kids Master theme. Monster Factory, that's Monster, Monster Factory. Monster Factory, I keep saying Hunters. I'm getting the two confused here, I guess. Monster Factory, after that, I stuck to the kids' games and broke out Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. So yeah, I kind of got like two weeks, I basically played the same games two weeks in a row. Um, having just sold those hardcore gamers on Monster Factory, I basically did the whole, hey, you want to check out an even better kids' game? And they're like, yeah, sure, what the heck? Because at that point, I'd sold them. They were like, we had fun with Monster Factory. We trust Moda Prodigious, another kid's game that's fun. Uh, and this is when Nick came over and joined our table, too. So that was nice. Uh, this was what I love about the public play events, right? Uh, it ends up that the miniature gamers weren't there. Nick was there. We were playing game. Nick came over, joined our table. It was awesome meeting Nick. I'd, I'd never like, I'd met him. We've been in the same gaming space. We've been in the same area, but we never played together. I love, that's why I love public play events, is getting to meet and get to know other local gamers. So that part was fantastic. Now, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters itself was as tense and enjoyable as ever. Uh, played two games, lost both. <laughs> Even though the first game was uneasy, though we were close, we are at like seven, we we're almost there. Uh, having now played the advanced rules a few more times, I don't even think Sean's tried the advanced rules. I think when we played on New Year's, we always stuck to the basic rules. Yep. I really like the advanced rules. There's a lot more shuffling going on, which makes the hauntings less predictable. Where if you don't shuffle the deck, everything just comes out, not necessarily in order, but like all the letters are going to come up. You add two extra shuffle cards in the deck with the advanced rules, so it just happens more often. So I found that neat, and man, the locked doors. Wow, do they add a lot of tension and frustration, but in a good way? I got to say, the next time I break this out with gamers, I'm probably going to just skip right to the advanced rules. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, it's not like it's, I mean, even advanced rules, it's not like it's, uh, you know, we're not talking weight three yes. here. We're still talking a weight one point, you know, 1.2 instead of 1.14. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's yeah. not, uh, it's not a rough game, but it really is just fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we just keep hoping for the right sale to come up. So, cause I, I, I'm really interested in seeing how they expand it and whether yeah. or not that expansion, uh, actually improves the game or if it's a money grab. Because yeah, I, possible. Have, I haven't heard opinions either way, really. Like when it first came out, I heard people excited about it, but then I didn't really hear anything. Uh, like again, the cycle of games. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the expansion has got a high rating, but expansion ratings are always suspect because generally the people who buy them are the people who really like the game really like in yeah. the first place. So that's probably a good sign though. All right. One other game night this week, uh, Monday night. It wasn't Monday night. We didn't end up gaming on Monday night. This was a two player game night, just Deanna and I. Uh, the problem is it's like almost November, like in two days. And I still haven't played or to be honest, even opened all the games I brought back to origins. And I need to get moving on that. Um, both for my own personal sake, cause I hate having a pile of games I haven't played, but also I did get these as review copies. Some of these games, most of these games, actually almost everything from origins. And I need to get it out there, right? I need to do, do the work now that I've got the games. So I'm trying to step up my new game, new to me game night. So I wanted to at least play the games with Deanna for one to get them played. Plus to now I know how to teach the game. I played them once so I can bring them out to public events. So I'm looking to bring a bunch of new stuff to extra life this weekend. So that's part of this. Uh, the first game we played was gold West from tasty minstrel games. Uh, this is a really solid short abstract game. Uh, it's got the old West gold rush theme though. It probably could have been anything. It's definitely more abstract than thematic. Uh, it has top-notch components for an abstract game. Um, wait, I said the Vinhos cardboard was thick. This is as thick, though not quite cut as well. Like somehow Vinhos, like their quality was just a bit, bit better. But man, thick chips, man. It, they, it was so nice because uh, you could really 
pick them up. Like you can manipulate them. You put the chits out on the board. And I, especially with cards, I'm terrible with cards, but sometimes little chits, you have a hard time picking them up. Man, these were so easy to pick up. That that was a huge bonus. It's interesting, actually. I'm just looking at this game, and uh, you know, with a with a one hour gameplay, this is something that uh, I'd love to try and see if we could if I could squeeze in on the on the weekend. Yeah, it looks like a no. Fun... I think you'll like it. So the actual mechanic, the the killer app of this game, is a Mancala based mecha- mechanic, where instead of going around, you have an end to your Mancala, so you don't just keep going in circles. So you've got four bins of goods. You're going to pick up all the goods from one of them and then drop one good in each bin above it going down to the top of your board. And then whatever's left over is going to determine what you can do, which is kind of interesting. Like that tells you the actions you can take. So there's metals, which are copper, silver, and gold. You use those to fulfill investments, gain influence in the town, and move your stagecoach along a shipping track. And there's three tracks, one for gold, silver, and uh, bronze. Now, wood and stone are the other two resources. Those are you to build camps and settlements. If you have one of them, you build a camp. If you have both, you can build a settlement. Okay. Now, the actual game is more of a kind of a point salad. It's not a step and fell, but it's kind of got that feel because you're going to get points for how far you along, are along those shipping routes. You're going to get bonus points at certain spots on them. If you're the first player to get so far, hit a landmark on them. You're also going to get points for fulfilling investment orders. And then you're going to get bonuses if you're the first one to do it. So it's kind of the same thing as the shipping there where the earliest to get a bonus. Um, adding influence to the town adds a whole end game scoring mechanism. And the options are random. So what's in the town is different every game. So that's kind of cool. And then the are four different types of terrain in the game. And every time you take a chip of a terrain, you mark on your board how much influence you have in that terrain. And then it ends up being an area majority scoring at the end of the game. And then you also get a points for trying to make your stuff touch each other. So if all your camps and settlements are touching, your largest group gives you points. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, you know, this is really underrated on BGG. It hasn't gotten the uh, the, the sort of... Um... I, yeah, you know, there's to be honest, no buzz. Yeah, none. I I don't think I've heard anyone talk about Gold West before. And uh, it looks beautiful. And and apparently it's been re-implemented this year by Rolled West, which huh. is uh, apparently the thing. dice-based version of the game, uh, which is much tighter, smaller, compact. It's four dice. Yeah, and it's four dice and a couple kind of player board. Thing. Yeah, it, it's it's four four dice and a and a and a right on right off uh, player board. Interesting. Uh, the biggest shock I think for this was how quick it was. Like you already noted, it's like hour, 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. Uh, this was our first game. So it was a learning game where I had to teach Deanna and I think we were done in under an hour. We might've been done in under 45 minutes. Now that's with two. You can play five. Um, this, this, this might be a thinky filler, but I think it's going to be more of that, um, Bruges, um, haunted Teutonica level of really quick point salads, which is like a new thing that's surprising me that I'm, I, that it, I'm surprised it works. Um, what's the one with the auctions? I'm drawing a blank on that game. I love that game. We just played it at the extra life. I'm drawing a blank, but it's another one that's in that, that 100, 100. Whoa. Sorry. That one hour range or less. Right. I, it played good two players, uh, but uh, three, three is, uh, three is, is the, the recommend. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The thing is, it's area majority. And we talked about this when we did the big what's the difference between area majority and area control is those type of games just aren't great with two players because everything is have or have not. You get the points or I get the points. Once you throw a third player into that mix, the game, every game with area majority area area control is going to be better with three people because yeah. you never have that. I got it. Or you don't. It's always have or have nots. And whoever has the most is going to win. So once you throw a third player in that mix, you're going to have a little bit more difference. Yeah, I have a feeling it's going to be a way better game with three. I I don't see why it would be bad at four, but I haven't tried it yet. By three and three and four have the majority of votes. I, I'm always looking now at the breakout when I see the uh, the best. Uh, yeah. Click I, regardless now of what it says. I click the button and look at the actual breakdown of votes, uh, and it makes a huge difference. Uh, but definitely, yeah, three and four is definitely the uh, the go to. Well, hopefully, we'll get this played this weekend, and you can check it out. Yeah. Now, the other game we played, of course, was Vinos. Uh, Deanna and Plyve played Vinos Deluxe, but I've told you all about that in the game room. So, <laughs> All right. Well, I've had Duke at the table a couple more times. Uh, I'm really enjoying that morning uh, morning game with my son. Uh, he is still in the lead on the, uh, the win-loss column, but uh, we're getting closer. I tweeted out a, uh, a picture of our last game 
uh, where we burned through all but two tiles each in the bags. Uh, and that was actually that, that one we didn't finish in the morning. We actually uh, froze it when he had to go to the bus, came back to it at the end of the uh, after school and still went for about another 45 minutes or an hour uh, to finish it off. I have never had a game of Duke it that was, long. It was a long, careful game. And the pulls were just sort of, it was like, oh, I got a good pull. And oh, you got a good pull. So we're just going to cancel those out and move on. Or I got a great pull and you got a horrible pull. And you're just going to have to run away to, you know, try and make up for it while I eat your pieces. And yeah, it's. Uh... I wonder if are there any draw rules in the Duke. Like if you do get to that point where all you have left is like a Duke and a Duke. I haven't checked. I'm sure there are. There must be. Yeah. Um, it's never come up in our game. Yeah, no, so. I've never. I've. Yeah, we, we got close enough. I should probably check. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. When I saw that, I'm like, man, with those tiles left, you're lucky you caught him. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the one really nice thing I like about the Duke is that I can have a fantastic strategy. I can be more strategic than my son. And I don't think I am, obviously, because, uh, again, <laughs> he's beating me more than I'm uh, more than I'm beating him. Uh, but there's that little bit of randomness of the poll mm -hmm. that so that, you know, it's not, you know, the chess grandmaster isn't necessarily going to win because they can't think 140 moves ahead. Yeah. You know, because they just don't know what's going to come out of the bag uh, for either person. Uh, and so that's the reason I like it more than chess. Uh, even though, you know, chess absolutely has its place. Uh, I, I don't necessarily want to spend that much time in brain Bernie on a game. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when we're doing it in the mornings before school uh, and I haven't had enough coffee. Uh, I yeah. <laughs> couldn't possibly handle something that brain burning. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, and it's just fitting that spot so nicely. And if you ever do want that little bit more brain burning, a little bit more strategy to seek out Yarl. Right. Or borrow my copy. Cause I don't play it that often. Well, and we still haven't even thrown in the Arthurian tiles yet. I still, yeah, have, to figure, I still have to figure out Arthurian tiles. He, he wants to, it's just not, not been something I've gotten around to yet. <sighs> so that was it for my week and Sean's week. All right. Uh, and how about a look ahead? What do you have uh, planned in the coming week? Well, uh, well, um, I don't know. There's nothing going on this weekend. And no, obviously, Extra Life all the way. I, that's everything about everything right now. 33 hours of gaming goodness going on at the CG Realm. Though, for me, I'm sure there'll be a nap in there at some point. But there will be games going on for hours and hours and hours. Um, a big part of that is going to be getting some new games. As I mentioned, I got a bunch of stuff I want to get played. It's almost November. The year's almost up. It's not like I'm under an obligation. Like I got to get this done by the end of the year, but it just at this point, I feel like I'm slipping behind on the reviews. So I want to try to get some stuff out. Um, as you probably noticed, I've been getting a lot of plays of these games in, right? I've talked about eminent domain a lot. I've talked about dead man's cabal a lot. I think I need, I'm spending too much time on some of these games while I do want to play them enough to give a solid review. I think I need to, all right, we played that five time to play something else. Uh, which does go to show how good some of these games are that I do keep playing. Yeah. So I think the big thing in the next coming weeks after extra life and some of it extra life at extra life is getting new stuff to the table. So. Well, I'm hoping to uh, get something played with you guys on Friday. Uh, we'll see what that is. We were talking about maybe maybe breaking open the Minecraft game and uh, doing that on Friday. And then I, too, will be at Extra Life for 33 hours, uh, both behind the camera and uh, probably in front of it for some games. Uh, I don't know if I'll do 33 hours, but yeah. uh, I am. I, 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 will have a, I will have a <laughs> box of uh, 100 uh k cups of jet fuel so we'll sir jet setter uh red eye yeah. so we'll see uh we'll see what happens all right uh and we're gonna make a little detour here uh we're hopping into the lobby uh we have a belated ask me anything from at fryban on twitter okay my son is trying to recall the name of a civilization game that he heard about on the show recently Civ something or something Civ is all he has to go on. Does it ring any bells? I wonder if it's CV. I wonder that we've talked about recently on the show. I mean, uh, there's civilization, about, which is, you know, Sid Meier's yeah, civilization. Yeah, we don't talk but, about that on the show a lot. That's uh, why. But it has, think, it has been mentioned, but. Um, not civilization. Uh, CV, I'm wondering, it's like. CV is in Curriculum Vitae, which I'll probably pronounce wrong, which is a, a really fun card 
and dice pay scheme that uses Yahtzee mechanic where you're rolling dice to match symbols on a card to build your resume. And the best part about that game is you're telling a story, the story you tell at the end, like, oh, I went to college and then I got fired and then this happened. That's a really neat one. And then there's civil, civilizations. So it's spelled CV and then lizations, which is a civ building version of CV, but it gets rid of the dice and it's card based. But we were talking uh, about that. It also, it, it could be through the ages. Yeah, we do play through the ages a lot on so through uh, the ages, a story of civilization. A new story of civilization. Sorry, there's two. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> you want a new story. Yeah, of a new story of civilization for 2015. Yeah, we we play we play a lot of through the ages on board game arena. That is a really good game. It could be that. Um, we did talk about the colonists a long time ago. That is an epic game. You talked about long gaming sessions. It we played it over three weeks, three Mondays in a row where we did era one and two, there's four eras in the game. We did era one and two the first day, era three the next day, and then the following week we did era four. That's the colonists, that's possible. Um, yeah, that, that was a while ago. When we yeah, talked about colonists the colon through the ages and Sid Meier's Civilization are the, are the ones that- Yeah, but I've never even played Sid Meier's Civilization. No, Interestingly have, enough, I got a copy today. We, we have actually talked about it on, uh, when we were talking about 4X games a while back. So okay. that's the only reason I, I think of that. Yeah, I haven't actually played that. Yeah. I kind of want to talk about mass trades because that's how I got it, but I haven't actually played it yet. <laughs> I haven't gotten it yet. That might be a topic next week I might talk about. So next week on the show, we may be just doing an extra life warm up just because we're probably going to be burnt out from extra life. So we'll see. I wrap up, not warm up, wrap up. That, that's possible. I think I want to talk about mass trades a bit because I've done one now so yeah. I can... And and I, I wouldn't I have good things to say and oh my god the person who runs the the site that everyone uses like grow up <laughs> like like admit to change and modernity please because that site is horrible oh it is the worst site I think I've ever seen in my entire life like it it, it it's worse than burning torches and opening mailboxes it really is yeah it, no it, it was it was my it, god yeah I mean people talk about geocities and laugh about that oh this no this is, is worse, worse. this is pre geocities. Yeah, Geocities no, would is... be an upgrade for this game or this. AOL website. had a better interface, yeah. like when it launched. Like, yeah. oh, okay. I guess I'm already ranting about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> distraction. All I'm right. glad we we did it. We did a math trade for for extra life, and it went through, and it worked. Like, it people are making trades. I'm like, it's awesome. Right. I thought that was cool. I I'm trying to think, anything else. Civ. I can't. I don't know. Like we yeah. talked about roll through the ages, being a a good intro. Uh, a good intro gateway game, a good game that's good for uh, gamers and non-gamers together. That's a civilization-based game where you have wooden board to mark, mark your resources. I think we also talked about it for some other purpose where we were like small footprint games. I apologize, Fryman, with what you've got. Um, that's all I can think of. All right. And now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Graham Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, looking forward to DCC raking in the big bucks for extra life. Will Cheap jars and funnels go together so well. There we go. William Fisher, thanks. Danielle Thomas, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit YouTube and your podcatchers at 2 a.m. every Tuesday morning. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on.